this chronological book of, of the New Testament. So uh, we're going to turn it over to Mr. John Cohen. There are no armed guards at the door keeping me out, so I, I feel welcome here today. Thank you. You want to start him up here? Well, and Larry showed up too. Where's Larry? Larry showed up. Yeah, that's testimony that uh, I'm doing okay. He said, Larry said, if I come back, that means, if I don't come back, it means you're lousy. <laughs> and he didn't come back last week, so I felt pretty bad, but uh, he came back this week, so I feel better. Did you notice every week the crowd gets bigger and bigger? Well, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's my worldwide presence on the web now. You know? it's, it's very cool. Um, so, uh, again, thank you. Uh, I am John Coma. Uh, spelled with an H, but pronounced Koma. Uh, the, uh, I'm just a big Slovak guy, uh, but I've been living in Burlingame now for I don't know, what, 36 years, maybe something like that. And um, I am an executive coach as a real job and, and leadership development person. So if you need any of that, I'm here. But also, uh, I am uh, the chairman of uh, Hillcrest Chaplaincy, which uh, 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 Steve was a part of. Uh, at one time, and you guys have been very supportive of the chaplaincy, which is what, uh, and uh, there's a little explanation that we need to have there. Hillcrest is the old name for the, the Youth Services Center, or Juvenile Hall, up on the hill on 92 between, it's in the intersection 92 and uh, 280. If you look up on the hill, you'll see some big buildings. One's a green building, one's a white building. Those are all part of the juvenile uh, system up there. And we go and we deliver Bible studies and every Tuesday evening, and uh, we also deliver worship services, which is kind of interesting because uh, it's also a high school. So these are high school kids, ages about, they say 12, but I think it's more like 14 they start at and, and go to about 17. And voluntarily, they choose to come to Bible study and or worship service. Uh, and we are the providers of that. So, Is that open to public? Well, in a way, if you would like to particularly come to, it's easiest to get someone into a uh, Sunday worship service. So if you were ever interested in just kind of seeing what's going on and seeing the kids, uh, you, we welcome you to do that. It's easier for us to get you into those. On Tuesday nights, it's a little tougher. Uh, we have, eventually we have to have you go through a screening and fingerprinting and things like that to get people in on a regular basis. So the cavity search, right? What's that? <laughs> the cavity search. Yeah. Well, yeah. It's, it's, you know, they have to be, they have to be careful. It's a penal institution, really. You know? it's a detention institution. Is this the one Ev Benton is treasurer? Yes, Ev, and Ev is one of the... Uh, family here at so, First Press Burlingame. That's well, so Ed, Ed's under a lot of strain yes. right now because of his wife. And so if there's anybody who wants to be a bean counter and just do some treasury work, he would love to step down. Right. And so, yes, we are short on board members. So uh, should you have the urge, and we're going to be talking about that a little bit. I, I mentioned that we're going to have a life application portion of this. Uh, yeah, I'll find it. The, um, uh, based on Chip Ingram's uh, Holy Ambition, which is about uh, the life of Nehemiah. But uh, at the end, I want to bring us back around to some life applications that we, from the learnings that we've had that you guys can take with you, particularly to the Braveheart event going on. And uh, hopefully your life has been enriched by the better understanding of the, the Old Testament and how particularly the books of Ezra and Nehemiah give you that uh, ski jump for and kind of 450 years of flying into the New Testament, which in my estimation makes it like, I don't know, a gazillion times more exciting, if that's a word. Um, but because there's more depth, there's more meaning, there's more understanding, there's greater appreciation for what the people were thinking at the time. And so when the Messiah actually shows up, you can, you can almost literally see their, their hearts and minds explode you know, with excitement and, and because they're anticipating it that much. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to catch up with some of the people 
that haven't uh, been to the first two sessions just very quickly and kind of remind that also the people who have been here some of the kind of the direction we're going kind of we're in this uh, flow here and that's going to take us into the life application part okay you're going to be with me there oh great we've got the prophetic package of hope up here but, but any that's great no, that, no that's that's okay. good that's good so just briefly for those of you who have this part, there's two pages that were sent. This is on the second page. But, no, you don't have to put that up. That's fine. <coughs> but the, um, the first part was really my best effort to try to help you understand the flow of the Old Testament. Because in order to appreciate Ezra and Nehemiah, you really have to understand what preceded it and what's going on kind of locally. Uh, so, where we are is after, you know, here's where the Old Testament starts, and it goes from creation, and then you have the Exodus, and then you come down, up, down here, and you have a divided kingdom where there's Israel and Judah. And um, they're both not doing real well. They're kind of sick nations to a certain extent. So they have prophets that speak to the northern kingdom, which is Israel, and the southern kingdom, which is Judah. And when you hear the word uh, Israel, it's they're not necessarily the white hats all the time. They're... They could be the bad guys. And so we talked about um, uh, two kings during this period right here. Uh, we talked about uh, Asa and Ab his son Abijah. Asa was uh, blessed by God because he really trusted God, mostly because he was overwhelmed. He had no other choice. He was, he was in a battle, and he just said, <laughs> God, you know, I can't win this battle. And so they just kind of blew the trumpets, and the, and the Levites prayed, and and um, God defeated the enemy. Just de defeated him right there. And so he was blessed for that. For his heart, uh, even though he was in a desperate spot, for his, giving his heart totally to God and keeping it in God's hand. His son Abijah eventually took over, and he did that once too. He gave his heart totally to God. He was in the same situation, surrounded. And he just said, God, you know, obviously we can't win this. It's all yours. And boom. God wins the battle. And that's all you know. You know, it's so, it's so interesting in the Bible. You don't get any other details than that other than God caused the victory, which is cool. But the next time that happens, Abijah kind of thinks strategically. And he said, well, you know, I'll do this and I'll do that. And I'll pay a ransom over here or, you know, kind of a bribe. And uh, I'll end up getting what I want. And God says, uh, and this is kind of a key uh, key verse in what we've been talking about here, which is 2 Chronicles 16.9. Uh, but, uh, let me give you a second. Let's, which is, uh, and I'll just paraphrase it. It says, uh, for, God, for God's eyes search to and fro uh, over all the nations for hearts that are completely His. And then the sentence, that makes us all feel good, right? But then he tells Abijah, well, you failed. Your heart wasn't completely mine this time. And so Abijah kind of has a, a, a rough ending. But it just, it, it uh, really makes the point that God is truly interested in our whole heart, having our whole heart dedicated to him. So part of what we're going to talk about when we get to the life application portion of this is, does God have your whole heart? You know, really. Are you acting in a way? Are you talking in a way? Are you treating people in a way? Are you um, praying in a way that tells God and whomever might be, you know, watching um, that God has your whole heart. So that's what that's all about. And even to the point where I'll get to where uh, Chip Ingram in Holy Ambition talks about, has your heart been broken? That's a sign that God is speaking to you. Okay? So, kind of moving on from that. We're in this green area here. So the, the exodus has happened. <clears throat> Here and because Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar came into Jerusalem, 
surrounded this city and eventually destroyed the city, and in three different events took the people into exile from Jerusalem. And they went to Babylon, that's where you get the stories of Esther and Daniel, primarily. Those are the ones people remember most. But there was a prophet at the time, Jeremiah, who not only predicted that Nebuchadnezzar was going to come, but he, um, so he was called a prophet who uh, uproots and tears down, but he was also the prophet who, who plants and builds up. And part of the, the tearing down was he warned the people, you know, this is going to happen. You're all, you know, we have forsaken the, the laws and the Torah. So we're in big trouble, and nobody listened to him. And whenever, so whenever you see a picture of Jeremiah, he always looks like he has a migraine or he's sad, <laughs> something like that. But Jeremiah is a key player in what happens in Ezra and Nehemiah. In fact, in the first sentence, you get the name Jeremiah. So for about 70 years, they're exiled out. Uh, and then the Babylonians are, are uh, defeated by the Persians. So the Persians come in. And in the first year of King Cyrus, uh, 539 BC, he uh, tells in, his, in an edict that begin, that's at the beginning of Ezra. I'll get to that here. At the beginning of Ezra, he says, um, "In the first, and this is how the the book starts. In the first year." of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he made a proclamation throughout all the kingdoms and put it in writing. And his proclamation was that uh, the people were to go back to, uh, to Jerusalem. And so he sends... The first wave, and these names are kind of important here, because Zerubbabel was a direct connection to the line of David. So, the other thing that's happening here, when that edict came out, and here's a king of Persia, um, kind of a heathen nation, uh, declaring this, boom, everybody in the room ties into uh, this prophetic package of hope that they're looking for. And the prophetic package of hope is part of what Jeremiah was talking about. Jeremiah, um, I believe it was in Jeremiah, particularly 31 to 33, but there are several places there. Jeremiah 25, I believe Jeremiah 17 too. But he starts talking about what to expect when um, uh, we are going to be... Uh, just like uh, Moses taking the, the uh, Israelites out of Egypt, when we're going to be f truly free and we're going to be truly connected to God. So there has to be, there will be a new covenant with God. It's not the old blood, blood covenant where God trusted us to obey a certain amount of rules and the, the Ten Commandments. This is a new covenant that it would be written on our hearts. And that's in Jeremiah 30, 31, but it's also in Ezekiel 36, 25 through 28. There'll be a future Messiah king. There'll be glory in the temple again. So the temple has to exist and there has to be glory there. Um, that God's kingdom will involve all the nations. In fact, Jeremiah was called the prophet not only to uh, the Israelites, but to all nations. So, uh, and then uh, to fulfill the promise of Abraham. And so they're looking... Not only, we hear a lot of times that they're looking for the Messiah, they're actually, that, and that's great, but they're also looking for the entire package. They're looking for the glory of the temple. They're looking for these other things. They're looking for something that's going to be written on their heart, and they're wondering, you know, how does that happen? How does that happen that something, the word gets written on my heart? Not like circumcision. What's that? Not like circumcision. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a type of, type of circumcision, right? It's a type of your heart. So, uh, kind of that's where we are to a certain extent when we come into Ezra and Nehemiah. This great anticipation, 
this, uh, this kind of flood of people finally coming back to uh, Jerusalem in, in three waves. So they left in three waves, they're coming back in three waves. <clears throat> and the first wave is Zerubbabel, Sheshbazar, and Jeshua. And really what they uh, bring is to reestablish kind of the community. Uh, when they see particularly the name Zerubbabel, uh, that's in the line of David, and they get excited. Zerubbabel was, is connected directly to the last king of Jerusalem in the, uh, in the uh, Babylonian exile. <clears throat> He's the son. Uh, and so they get excited. They think there's a lot of, you know, this, uh, there are a lot of key indicators here. <clears throat> Sheshbazar and Jeshua all come together to do that. So they, they return to Israel. Now, they run into... Now, this is supposed to... I should make maybe a stop sign here. But this is a hand, because they face opposition. Okay, so uh, the king of Persia, in this case Cyrus, sends them. They face opposition. And one of the things that, that happens with Zerubbabel uh, is they, they come upon the people of the land. And the people of the land are uh, some of the Jews who were left behind because not everybody was exiled. Left behind, they stayed back, they married people, local people, not necessarily Jews. And uh, so there was a big mix there, all right, mixture of, of people when they came back. Now these people came to Zerubbabel and they said, let us help build the temple. Now this is in, again, this is in... Uh, Ezra. So these two books are in Ezra. Let us rebuild. And, and uh, Zerubbabel, and this is kind of controversial. We don't know why it's in the Bible. Is it for teaching and understanding? Or are we to kind of salute and be exactly like Zerubbabel? It's hard to tell. It's kind of one of those things you would want to have a deep theological discussion with, about, you know, with other people. Uh, but Here's what he decided to do. He, he refused to have them help. This is not you, your temple, you know, so go away to the people of the land. <clears throat> now, if you reflect back, I said Jeremiah was supposed to be the prophet not only to the Israelites, but to the nations. So as God is kind of thinking these larger dreams, it seems that some of the people involved in the effort were thinking, having smaller visions, smaller dreams. Now, is that a total sin, or is that a half a sin? I don't know. They were doing their best. You know, they were doing their best as people. So, uh, they faced opposition, and uh, Zerubbabel eventually, eventually dealt with it. But you'll see this same theme of king, opposition, and uh, you know, some strange anticlimax in each one of these three books. They're all set up to be the same. And that's a great way they use these biblical writers used to teach people. They would have uh, similar uh, patterns that they would say. In fact, in, um, in the book of Ezra, uh, there is a, a portion of it, and I think this is in the Edict portion, where they call it symmetry. That you'll have one... Um, You'll have um, a verse that starts out, and there'll be a word in that verse. Oh, this is going to be sloppy, but sorry. But the word will appear both in the first verse and the last verse. But you'll have a, a second, a second line here with a different word, different word, different word, middle passage. This word will reflect that word. This word will reflect that word. And uh, the, imagine being the reader of this. What all of a sudden you're reading the story, and oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. That's interesting. Then all of a sudden, by the time you're about here, you're going, "Wow, oh, this is repeating backwards. <laughs> that's significant." So there were there were techniques used by, and the, the writer of these books is called. Uh, some people think it was Ezra. Some people just call the writer the chronicler. Techniques used to help people feel like this was the word of God, that this was the breathed word of God. 
And the symmetry uh, element is, is part of that. So there's a lot of connections that they're trying to do here. So we get to uh, the book of Ezra. And in Ezra, um, it's all about the Torah and the community that they're trying to create. So Ezra was a scholar, and he was a Torah expert, uh, and he uh, brought back the Torah. And right now, the, the, these, these three were building the temple, and there's about a 60-year span between this and this, and somewhere around here, the temple finally gets built. One of the op things that uh, the Zerubbabel ran into was the, uh, they kind of denied his building permit. Because <laughs> they got worried about you know, these people rebuilding the temple. They thought they were um, rabble-rousers. So they uh, took away his building permit. And it took him that long to get the building permit back. And, have another king sign off on it, Arxaxerxes, and uh, finish the building of the temple, the foundation and the temple itself. So when they did this, they started with the altar first. Their building permit ran out, and they had to get it redone. About 40 years later, they're able to, to fix it. Then Ezra comes in to bring the Torah to the temple. So they're, in the meantime, they're making sacrifices and everything else. Um, Ezra comes with the Torah. Now, uh, he runs into uh, opposition as well. And, uh, let's see if we get to this. So, well, one of the big things that happens there is that uh, he realizes, just like Zerubbabel was frightened by the people of the land who had transformed, uh, Ezra realizes that I'm teaching the temple, but I'm teaching it mostly to kind of mixed groups. This is not, these are not Hebrew people primarily. And so uh, what happened with, even back in the days of uh, Asa and Abijah, that little, those battles I told you about, they were having trouble with idols coming into the, the kingdom, into Jerusalem. And, and there were, so there was a fair amount of idol worship going on here. And Ezra is wondering, well, what do I do? I'm teaching the Torah. We only have one God that we worship. And these people still have elements of um, idol worship in their houses and everything else. So he sees it as a, um, as a culture problem, primarily driven by uh, marriages. These marriages bring in these different cultures. And so he ends up... Um, with a divorce decree that the only way we're going to solve this is through divorce. Well, truth is, he was trying to live up to uh, Deuteronomy. Let's see. And I'm not going to be able to pull this up very quickly. But uh, it's, I'm going to say Deuteronomy 20. But it's uh, a passage that says, you know, you need to keep. Uh, be a holy people. So he interprets holy people as holy seed. He sees that as a marriage problem. He has this divorce decree. Some of the people, maybe not all the people, get divorces. And um, so he has that problem. And everybody's kind of scratching their head. Again, you know, is this a God thing? How does this apply to the story? How does this help us? Uh, this is, this is uh, not a good thing. Even the prophets of the day we're saying that you know divorce is a bad thing. So that's what he was, and still he went ahead. So, but the Torah was being reestablished. So then you have we're coming into the next story about Nehemiah, and uh, now again these um, I don't want to as I talk about some of the difficulties that these people face. It's not I, I don't think at all that these people these are bad people. What I think is they were put in a very difficult situation as an example to us, so we could, over a cup of coffee, talk about some of these things and try to figure out, because we face similar things all the time these days. There are people, there are people of, the, uh, of the land, for example, that um, are, are, do things that are close 
to Christianity, and they're, they dedicate their lives to God, um, do we shun them or do we invite them? Or are, do we make an assessment based on kind of individual circumstances? You know, so we don't get clear answers here. We're still to, to wrestle with uh, each and every thing that we're faced with in a kind of a personal way. We look at, at what was decided here and we can say, hmm, you know, could that have been done better? And, well, it seems like they're all well-intentioned yeah. things, uh -huh. but when they narrow or diminish God in the process, like you said, down to the one verse of Deuteronomy, and that narrow version of holy yeah. led to perhaps some worse social unrest than, rather than convincing the idol worshippers that there was a better way, yeah. he said, just cut them out. Yeah. Yeah, and, and some of the, if you dig even a little deeper, it gets even like more mysterious. Uh, the, uh, I, and uh, this is one of the things I read. I'm, you're welcome to prove me wrong, by the way. Read, read all this stuff and validate it yourself, please. <laughs> but um, uh, that uh, when he was interpreting this verse from Deuteronomy, which says, Holy people, the the word, and that has three Hebrew letters, three or four Hebrew letters. And if you move the letters around a little bit, it becomes holy seed. So just by taking that verse, maybe moving some of the letters around a little bit, he made his case for something that happened with the Canaanites back in Moses' days, how it applied to uh, the people of the land in his day. And also, by doing this, he was saying that the people, the Canaanites, or these people here in the land, were just like the Canaanites. And that's probably really a false statement, right? Uh, that's a false assumption. Yeah. I mean, there's a moderate parallel to that. I think our, we, we could make the same claim. In fact, a lot of the churches, too, were the ones true faith. You know, buck up and come join us, or otherwise get out. Yeah. You guys can come just like the rest of society. You know, anything different? I mean, be parallel. Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of parallels. Um, you know, when I see this, I just see like the inherent sinful nature of man, like the repetitive Old Testament of how God hooks you up, and then it's like, okay, I was in contact with you, Lord. I gave my heart completely to you, and you hooked it up. Yeah. And now I'm in another position where I have to make this really important choice, but instead of giving my whole heart to you again, Lord, I got this, because I'm almost feeding off of the results of, of the miraculous thing, and I'm like, but now I got this, and like just like God's will versus self-will. And just the repetitive, inherent nature to, again, do what you think is best with all the right intentions. I mean, it's like, well, that kind of rings a bell. And like, yeah. thanks for that, Lord. I'll take it from here. And, and, and um, uh, Ezra did all the right things, too. He, he prayed about it. He went to the Bible, the scriptures, to kind of validate kind of where he was going with this. He was under a little pressure um, politically to get this kind of expedited. Uh, so we got to give him, you know, kind of where he was. But these, all these guys were chosen by God and very godly men. Yet there were, they, godly men can make mistakes. Is one of the things that I learned from from this whole study. Was it like maybe, you know, one pursuing their agenda to try to garner the specific result? Like I mean, even from King Solomon, it was like here's the wisdom guy, and it's like, and yet he's being, again, drawn away because of his lust for women or whatever, and then uh, exactly. the idol worship and all that, and it's like, how many times do we have to learn that lesson? But again, so here I'm going to the word I'm praying about, it's like, well, I don't want this to happen, so let's do the divorce thing. And it's like, that was his agenda, maybe, to get the result of what was the desirable thing or the holy thing, but yeah. just maybe going the wrong way about it. And just it. like that, there's a lot of self-justification that can happen to make the wrong choice, because it's based on our vision or our choice. Uh, we find that that's what eventually happens, uh, even in Nehemiah. Nehemiah came back to rebuild the walls. Well, um, even Jeremiah imagined something for all nations. Well, how are all nations going to get through a wall in order to get to the temple to worship the God of Israel? Uh, and Ezekiel, uh, talked about the same thing, that all nations were going to come together and worship the God of Israel. Well, 
again, why do you need a wall then? But it, but it was um, part of, of Nehemiah's vision to reinstate the wall so you would have community and security and things like that. So you've got these competing visions, right? And we really, because it happened and because uh, it was kind of this story is relayed back to us for our own benefit, to, for us to learn, we have to think you know, that that was really God's um, providence there, making that, helping to make that happen. Yeah. I think the passage in Deuteronomy, is so, can I read that? First? Sure, yeah. This, this, and I think it relates to keeping them pure from worshiping other gods. Mm -hmm. That's the intent. And it says, do not inter it's De uh, Deuteronomy 7, 3 through 5. Do not intermarry with uh, do not intermarry with them. Do not give your daughters to their sons or take your daughters for your sons. For they will turn your children away from following me to serve other gods. And the Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. That's, mm -hmm. so the per and then it's the talks about breaking down the altars and all that other stuff. So it's really about purity and worshiping God rather than racial or anything else. Like that. Right. That's, that's the intent that it can be distorted. That's right. It can be distorted. And so we have to be careful about those things. I think that's why uh, a lot of decisions, if we're encouraged to come together as a, kind of like a community to discuss things, um, to give kind of the different points of view about certain things and, and share about them and really focus on God's will. One of the things that really impressed me, and I'm, glad, I'm so glad you brought that up because it reminded me, uh, you guys are familiar with Francis Chan, right? Oh, yeah. You had this whole series with Francis Chan. Well, there's this uh, movement in the Bay Area called Transforming the Bay for Christ. Have you heard about that? Yes, you heard it. Okay, it's, if you don't, haven't heard about it, you ought to try to hear about it. Because it's a big deal. We're trying to take the 3% population that, <coughs> excuse me, that are Christ followers and expand that, I don't know, I think tenfold, in order to create kind of a revival in the Bay Area. Well, Francis Chan, I'm at one of the meetings for Transforming the Bay, I mean, there's, you know, the crowd is all, all there and everything else, and Francis Chan has an emergency where his wife's in the hospital, so he rushes up to the podium and he says, I have something important to say. Can, can this speaker leave so I can say something very quickly? And he stands up there in, the, in the true Francis Chan way with his arms, you know, kind of flailing all over the place. He says, I don't want to be involved in this if it's not God's will. I don't want to be part of this. I don't want to waste my time if it's not God's will. And God's not in this, absolutely 100%. I don't want to be involved. Uh, and what he was saying was he was encouraging us to get to the point where we invited that Holy Spirit into whatever we were doing. That's kind of how I break that down, my interpretation um, of that. And so we need to seek... The, the kind of the counsel of the Holy Spirit with everything we do. And we hope that the Lord appeared. Now, I should, one more thing, and I want to get to your question. One more thing is that uh, the, uh, you know, I told you about the reestablishment of the temple. Now, one of the things when this all happened, that and this appears um, on this part I see, yeah, down here, I'm trying to take you through this, on this part, is that in the, um, in the building of the temple, yeah, oh, I'm sorry, in the building of the temple, there was joy, and I talked about this last week, there was so much joy that people are having a party, they're screaming, they're celebrating, but you almost couldn't hear it because of the weeping. The people who had seen the previous temple were weeping, because they did not see the fire and the excitement and the glory of the Holy Spirit being in this, this new temple. It wasn't there. So these old men are crying, everybody else is celebrating, can you imagine? And you see more of that, in Leviticus 9 and 1 Kings 8 talk about the glory of the original temple and what it was like. So it was real obvious, and you could see it from afar, so it was real obvious to these uh, people who had just witnessed the rebuilding of the temple, it wasn't there. 
So that's part of the kind of the disappointing end here, and it's very significant because that sets up that's really kind of in alignment with what happens with all the stories. It's uh, they kind of do the right thing, but then the other shoe doesn't fall. They create the wonderful uh, preparation for the celebration. You know, they, the wedding, they brought in the wedding planner, and they got all of the stuff going and everything, and they got the band there and everything else, but the bride and groom don't show up. All right, that's really kind of what happens at the end. Then you have the 450 year ski jump to the New Testament, and that's why you can see when they realize they're in the midst of the Messiah, some of them, that it was just an incredible, <coughs> incredible uh, answer to years and years of prayer. Okay? Good discussion, guy. Did I? It's okay, yeah. Keep no, no, going. Going. Okay, right. go ahead. Go Whatever you have. Well, I was going to pick on the words for a minute. You know, that, that TBC, Transfer in the Name of Christ, is trying to bring Christ to the, to the broader Bay Area so that there may be a revival. Yes. Well, the revivals are done by the Holy Spirit. Yes. It's not going to be our campaign to have yeah. a revival. So I think even that wording kind of is the power of man. We're going to help you <laughs> yeah. revival. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what Francis Chan picked up on. This looks like it could be just a man thing. You know, yeah. did somebody think this up and think it was a good idea? Like, like the vision yeah. Nehemiah had for the walls? Um, and I'm not saying it might be a bad thing. But so even if uh, him, but, but, but Francis Chan was saying, you know, come spirit, come. Be in the midst of this. Let this be your thing, mm -hmm. not a man thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. How do you know that? How, how, do you, how do you know when that's happening? How do you know when that's happening? That's a good question. That's a good question. Uh, you know, the only thing I, I think I could relate it to, it, for me personally, is every one of us has had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Hopefully, if you're here and you're saved and everything else. That, for me, my personal encounter with Jesus Christ was a spirit-filled um, uh, kind of series of events. That there was no other way that uh, what eventually transformed me could have been done without the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, we're probably given a, uh, an, a kind of a clue or an example in our personal lives that we could then later, when, when we see and recognize the Holy Spirit involved in something, really grasp onto it and, and get excited about it. That's my best guess. So each person involved in the Bay Area renewal has to have that experience of validation of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't know if it's every person, but uh, I would hope certainly uh, the people who were part of the, the driving forces half the time would end up like Asa and Abijah and just say, we can't do this. Holy Spirit, come. I think like the willingness that like for myself I might have when I'm broken or I'm in a tough spot, I say, hey, thanks, Lord. I'm going to trust in you now because <laughs> yeah. i got no choice. <laughs> and it's, you know, um, but even uh, like Peter was saying, I think that's really powerful because it's, again, to me it's about freedom. Like, you know, freedom in mind, body, spirit. Like, like is this putting people in freedom, like, you know, to, to mingle in the love of the Holy Spirit? Or is this, again, creating more of an agenda for people to pursue an outcome uh, based on their logic or their, again, I think it's like, and for me, like, when I'm searching for that discernment, like, is God in this? It's like, um, if I'm not praying about it, if I'm not talking about it, like, it's like, Again, I need that Francis Chen to say, hey, well, by the way, like, I know God was calling you to do this, but see, like, that big gold thing that you just built that cost you a bunch of money and did all this stuff, like, like that thing is really cool, but God really don't give a shit about that. He was talking about your heart you wanted. You know what I mean? Like, like, just trying to find a way to listen to your heart and be guided by it. And for me, the affirmation is not always in the result. I think, uh, for me, I've, I always put a lot of weight on the result, but when I learn to step outside of that and, like, get fed through the spirit of maybe the Holy Spirit or God or whatever it was, but through this, yeah. like through the connection of other people. In the like midst the of the journey. Yeah, exactly. Like the after, oh, things are going real shitty, Lord, what's up? And then you touch one person's life and it just, you're just lathered in like the, the, his blood. Or, do you know what I mean? Like it just cleans in it. Like it's the affirmation, you are doing the right thing. Yeah, like if, if, if our lives are closely tied to the Spirit, we realize, particularly if we 
we base it on Silicon Valley kind of values. Our life is not going that great, you know? It's really not. But if you're wrapped up in the Holy Spirit, you say, God, you know, God, uh, this is um, the journey that you have me on, and, and I'm going to love it. I'm going to love this journey, even though there's, there's difficulty. Blue? I think it's an awareness. Are we connecting? Yeah. Or disconnecting? Yeah. You know, it's just a kind of state of mind of where's the heart, where's the mind, are we connecting? Or yes. Are we disconnecting? And then the main connector is the Holy Spirit, right? That's, and we, because we can't do it ourselves. So right? do it. The, the Holy Spirit is the, the counselor, uh, the facilitator of our, our relationship with uh, God. And so we really need to rely and trust in our heart and give our heart to that whole effort. Um, yeah, step, and God out, honors that. step outside of the Silicon Valley result that we think we have coming or whatever, like I feel like God works so powerfully um, in so many different ways. And like when we can, for me, like when I can step out of my busy mind, it's going, and it's like, um, I mean, just like he was saying, like, am I really connected to the spirit and is that what's coming through? Because the payoff can be so much more rewarding uh, when it's not in the monetary value or in a worldly, when they say, like, not of this world. I, I feel like I connect to that more and more every day because it's, you know, serving God or serving the world. Like, I can't get both and I'm not going to get the worldly result when I'm yeah. pursuing God's agenda. But it might just, you know, cover everything on God's time, you know, not on mine. Yeah. The, uh, uh, just quickly, what... <laughs> One of the stories I heard during Billy Graham's uh, funeral uh, thing that came up was uh, when Billy Graham was just starting out, um, uh, he, somebody asked, I think it was Moody, if he would come and speak to this event in a, in a high school, in a high school gymnasium. And Moody wasn't available, so he said, well, there's this young guy, Billy Graham, you really ought to try him. And um, so uh, Billy Graham shows up and he does his thing. And um, like a month later, they asked, well, you know, what was the result? Did anybody come forward? And they said, well, yeah, one guy. And, <laughs> and, <clears throat> and it was, uh, and they said, well, do you have his name? And, it was, and he goes, yeah, Warren Beersby. Have you ever heard that name? Author, Warren Be Beersby, but a great Christian author. Wow. Uh, and um, so one guy. And the whole gymnasium came forward. But it was the, the guy, right? It was the guy that was most important. So, um, some cool things. So, just, I'm going to take it quickly, whoa, very quickly. If you would like, to, uh, there are a lot of, I'm just going to say, there are a lot of books on Nehemiah that talk in terms of the management, leadership, application of the things that he did in order to build the wall. I would suggest you look at those things. I'm sorry, we're uh, we had a great discussion, but we, I, I had planned to talk a little bit more into scripture, but um, I'll rely on you to do that. I'm going to go to volunteer to do a little scripture reading and read the book of Nehemiah. <laughs> now that I've set it all up for you. But we can have you back. Well, yeah, you can. <laughs> yeah. Good job, Tyler. Okay, well, uh, I really enjoyed uh, Chip Abrams' approach to this. He had, um, oh, let's see, about uh, he had several different things that uh, and he was talking about the significance of the heart. You know, that it, you know, we find out kind of at the end of the thing, you know, what God's continuing to look for, do kind of do you really love me in all of these things? And so to write his word on our heart. So we have that Holy Spirit in our heart. That's what he's concerned about. So what Nehemiah had, when he heard the words of Cyrus, well, actually, he was with Artaxerxes, I'm sorry. Um, he was the cupbearer, and he heard that the walls were all torn down in Jerusalem, and his heart just broke. And, they, and he wept, and some people say he wept for four months, maybe not straight, but you know, he was in that, that mode for four months of weeping. And he uh, dedicated himself to risk his life as the cupbearer to go to the king and say, can I go back and rebuild the walls of my city and the gates of my city? And uh, Arxaxerxes said yes. And not only that, I'll support you. I'll give you uh, funds. I'll give you an army. I'll return all of the things that were supposed to be in the temple that we took from you. It was great. But it began with uh, Nehemiah's dislocated heart. He was concerned about a place that was a far, as far away as Seattle or 
uh, Salt Lake City or Phoenix is to us. That far away, he had a dislocated heart, and he, it broke for him. So when, like I told you guys with these kids at Hillcrest, my heart breaks for him, even though I, I was never on the other side of that door, that they're behind in their little unit there in Hillcrest. Um, and I, and, but I, I just feel that someone needs to step forward and do that, and that mm -hmm. like God's called me to do that. <clears throat> and maybe some of you, hopefully. Um, that you, you almost need to have a broken spirit, that your pride can't get in the way of you making the right step forward. You can't just say, well, I've got a job to do, and i got this, and i got that, and uh, I'm already doing things for God, you know. I'm showing up to church, and I'm involved in this and that. Don't let that get in the way. If you've got a dislocated heart, break that spirit of pride and go do it. Um, you need to have a radical faith. You need to say, I believe in what they talked about here. And I believe not only kind of nodding my head and saying amen, you know, but I'm going to go out and do some of these things, and I'm going to kind of physically be involved, actively, mentally be involved in the journey that God wants me to be on, to be a part of, you know, the world that he wants to uh, evolve uh, for him. Uh, uh, Vic, uh, Nehemiah, this is the other great thing about Nehemiah, if you want to, talking about leadership or strategic planning, uh, very uh, excellent strategic planning, involving other people, getting, um, enlisting other people in the plan, Nehemiah was all about that. So Nehemiah 1 through 7, you're going to get a ton of that that you can directly apply to whatever you're doing. Just know that it doesn't end exactly the way Nehemiah thought. <laughs> That's the only thing. But his, his principles for working with people were outstanding. Um, he made a personal commitment that was above everything else. So commit. Commit. We hear, you know, anybody have <coughs> kids that are dating or, you know, not quite married? Yeah. I don't see a heck of a lot of commitment. Now, like, they don't get excited about commitment. I don't think I got excited about commitment. They really don't get excited. So I think commitment is kind of a lost you know, uh, principle in our world. And so it's good if you could be an example of that. And then courage. Um, being able to uh, overcome fatigue uh, that will you know, take, take that part away from you. you, know, you uh, fatigue is kind of the enemy of courage. You know, when you get tired, uh, as an athlete, when I got tired, I, I kind of just wanted to get off the field. <laughs> I didn't want to go hit that guy or do that thing. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but when you're tired as an athlete, literally, is the time you're most vulnerable to injury. Yes, that's so true. And so the metaphor to life, uh, if you're walking around constantly tired, yeah. you're constantly susceptible to injury of all kinds. Yeah, and you likely have a thyroid problem too. <laughs> so, so the last thing I want to leave you with, because you're going to Braveheart here, the last thing is the Braveheart speech that appears in Nehemiah 4:14, and um, this is how it goes. And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and the officials and the rest of the people, "Do not be afraid of them." Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Okay? Isn't that cool? So, you know, he's, he's uh, standing up before them, and he's saying, let's go do this. You know? Don't let anything get in the way. We've got a lot of things to fight for. What's that? Sound like your army recruited. I need you. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So who's going to sign up to the army? All right. We're going to war. Boys. Yeah, we're going to war. Well, each, you know, we should know that we're in a constant battle. That's what we should realize. And if you're not operating in that mode, uh, particularly in the Silicon Valley, I tell people who want to move here, I say you're coming across the demilitarized zone. If you move here, if you're a Christian, get ready. You know, put on your armor. Because if you were kind of, you know, walking to church in Texas, uh, guess what? It's a lot different here. So get ready. It's and, funny. Uh, the 
the word courage comes, I mean, we learned it in reading this book last night, and it comes from a French word which means heart. Mm. So, yeah. Well, again, guys, thanks for having me. So, uh, and um, for you guys who are going and not going to Braveheart, um, gosh, I pray that uh, the Holy Spirit shows up, that you're, you are continually being transformed and in a new way, in a surprising way, in an exciting way, and uh, that the rest of your journey with the Lord is uh, fabulous. So.